Okay, guys, welcome to the first series in the or first episode. <laughs> there you go. Started already, James. It's a good start. Welcome, welcome to the first episode of the series. For the whole year, we're going to be running this, the Wealth Creation Series. It's a working title. I'm not really sure what to call it. Um, have you got any suggestions, <laughs> James? Or, or we're happy with that just now? I think it's probably a thing that's going to evolve, Jim. Uh, and then we'll see where it takes us. Yeah, yeah. We'll set down a marker tonight and then we'll figure out a name for it. Yeah, I, I, I'll come. I mean, the reality is, it's just, you just, um, JFDI is the expression, and I'm not going to swear, but you know what it, you know what it means. It's just like, let's just get on with it and let's just, let's just do this. Uh, good evening, Richard. How are you? Uh, nice to see you on. Um, any questions, guys, please feel free to ask. The rules here, let's give some guidelines out to, so people understand um, as we go. Um, okay. So we'd love feedback um, every single time. So please engage with us. Um, if you agree with us, stick a thumbs up. If you're no very sure, just put a smiley face. Okay. So a smiley face in the comments or a thumbs up, a thumbs up agreement, smiley face. I'm not sure what you're meaning. Because um, if we get a lot of smiley faces, then we go, okay, we should be explaining that a bit deeper. Um, if we get a thumbs up, everybody's with us just now. Um, so that would be great if you could do that because we can't see you. You can see us, obviously, and we want to make sure this works for you. At the end of the day, this is a show for you in order to create wealth. Now, it's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen just as this one show. It's probably going to be a progress progressive improvement. So take stock of where you are right now. That's probably the rule, James. Eh? Take stock of where you are right now. And then when we get to the end of the year, then take stock of where you are then. And if you've, if, you, if you've increased your wealth as a result, and we'll talk about what wealth means really, um, if you've increased your wealth as a result of this, then fantastic. Give us a wee thumbs up or something to say that, you know, thanks very much um, for doing this for me or, or helping me out in this process. Uh, that's the key there. Uh, thanks, Jed. First one in there Well, a wee thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, so take lots of notes. I've even got it down here. I, I, I take loads of notes on everything. Even though I don't use them just now, um, and even though I think I know them, I, I always take notes. Now, here's one of the keys here, and I don't know. Do you do this as well, James? Do you just take the notes regardless? Because it. it aids retention. Absolutely. Yeah. So if, if you listen to something, you'll retain it. But if you write it, you'll retain it. But if you listen and write, you retain more than the individual parts themselves. So the key here is as well, is if you want to learn this and you want to learn how to create wealth over, over this year um, and how to do it for yourself and how to teach others possibly, uh, then then take loads of notes, uh, take everything down you can. You never know out of this one scenario, you might get a wee bit of nugget information. Um, it might set you off and you're away. Uh, probably the classic example of that for me is I went to a seminar in Edinburgh years and years ago, Legacy. I think it was, no, it, was, it wasn't a Legacy. It was before that, it was Russ Whitney. Or something like that. It was a it was an organization in America that did a show and, and it was free. And I turned up to it. And what I did from there was I took loads of notes, but it popped into my head it somebody said how to advertise for um properties that are not in the market that you can get before they go to the market is just put an advert in the paper, houses and flats for cash. And I went, Wow, it's as easy as that. <laughs> And I literally spent £16 a week on a wee lineage ad in the paper, and I got about six or seven properties out of that in a year, um, and all at really good value. Uh, most of the people I actually told, you'd be better to go on a state agent because I kind of give you that value. Um, and, and literally, they did go on a state agent. A lot of people thanked me for that process as well um, and for giving them that advice. But some people would say, look, I don't want to. I just want to exit. Um, I'm happy with that figure, even though I told them the right figure. And they says, look, I'm happy with that figure. I'm ready to go. Um, and, and and I was able to do that as a result. So so just out of that, going to that one seminar, I, I, I got that one bit of information, which which made me a small fortune. And that was free. That was free advice, effectively. They were trying to upsell me on something else next, but I, I wasn't up for it because it was kind of like, no, I'm no I'm no into that. I'm no into the upsell. We are not officially really upselling you here at all. Um, yeah, if you want to use five properties, um, to do your property management, absolutely fantastic, because we will be doing in-house with our landlords, investors as well. James is one of them. 
So we will be doing in-house Zoom sessions once a month, a deep dive into, into actual property investment strategies. Um, we will, James will also be doing joint venturing. So if you want a joint venture uh, and you don't know what to do, uh, but you want to make money, then James is there for joint venture um possibly and and then i, I would I, i'm there for joint venture as well more or less so we do have we do have some kind of agenda james yeah something like that but but if somebody doesn't use us so what we've had fun <laughs> 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 that's the reality eh? and we've learned something because you know repetition is the master mastery of of skill you know that's what it comes down to so the more you the more you say it the better you get at it the more you practice it, the better, the better you get at it, and the more you create wealth, isn't it? Absolutely, and I think to a certain extent, the Chinese have built a, an education system on that basis. You know, repetition until you get it. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, if everybody can give me a big thumbs up if you're on there, um, just give me a thumbs up just to tell me you're with us still and you understand the concept about what we're talking about. That'd be absolutely fantastic. Um, and we'll we'll kick off. Okay, so I thought I thought we would be talking about um, what is wealth and what does it mean. I mean, what what is the what is the difference between income and what is the difference between wealth? Because there is a difference, isn't there? Uh, and and let me let us go through this, and we'll go there. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, guys. Um, I've got good thumbs up there. Everybody's on the same track. Uh, appreciate that. That's really good. Um, so. If I was to show you this, um, would you think, give me a thumbs up if you think this is wealth. Now, I'm not going to say anything now. You're not going to say anything now, James, but just give me a thumbs up if you think this is wealth. Uh, you can see right now. And a smiley face if you think it isn't. Maybe we delay in the process. Okay. So smiley face. Yep, Heather's got a wee smiley face here. Um, thank you, Heather. Um, Deborah's got a wee smiley face here. Uh, Jed's got a wee smiley face. Thank you very much. You're all doing really well. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, and and yes, uh, I I would say yep. Richard smiley face as well. Yep. Uh, I would say yes. This is not well. It's amazing how many times people think this is wealth, though, James. Eh? It's true, uh, but it really depends on the use of this car because it could be wealth. If it's never driven and it stays in a, an airtight container for the rest of its days, then potentially it could increase in value. Yep. But I agree. It's not. But, the, but this car, this car is three hundred and seventy-six thousand pounds, and that's just the entry level. That's mental. Um, so, yeah, you're absolutely right. Air, air, airtight container um, kept and never driven, it put, potentially, if it's a limited edition, it could go up in value over a period of time. Um, but it's a lot of money to invest, isn't it? Absolutely. And there's better, better, better vehicles to invest that money. So is this wealth? I think I think, I think think we've maybe sussed the fact that this is, this is maybe no wealth. <laughs> but again... <laughs> Now, this is what people show on on um, upsells, don't they? About, you know, come and sign up to my seminar, come and do this, look at the boats I have, look at the cars I've got, look at everything else I've got, and yet they show things like this, and everybody's attracted to that as a natural result. But yet that's Absolutely. no wealth. It's a pull factor. You know, you get them standing in front of the country house with a couple of sports cars in the driveway. It's probably not even their house, and the vehicles will be leased or at the very least hired. Uh, and if you follow their course in the 90 days, you can be a multi-millionaire with, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't work like that, unfortunately, for the masses. Yeah, it, it doesn't, does it? I don't think there's anybody that's really been a, a, a millionaire within 90 days. I, I think, I think, I think people like, do you not think that, do you not think they exaggerate the truth? That's all part of the upsell, though, isn't it, really? You know? Yeah. You dangle the carrot and... If, you know, you'll, you'll get people that will gravitate towards it. Mm -hmm. um, what about this one? Could be. Wealth or not wealth. <laughs> okay. 
interesting. It's a it's a lodge. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, it's I, I, it's a lodge that depreciates in value. So that maybe, that maybe gives you a clue. Um, uh, wealth or no wealth? Uh, thumbs up if you think it's wealth. Uh, smiley face if you think it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just give everybody a chance to to say something. Yep, smiley face all round. I think everybody's got the the gist of this. I think everybody's beginning to understand the concept behind this about the fact that you know it is. Um, what is wealth and what's not wealth. Um, and I think that's really a good point. Um, everybody's on the same page as us. Uh, do you not think so, James? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I'm logged in on Facebook through my phone just so I can see all the comments going backwards and forwards and the little smileys. Perfect. Okay, so the next one. Thanks very much for responding, folks. Um, we have next one. Wealth. Is that wealth? Interesting. Give me a big thumbs up or a smiley face if you think this is wealth. If you think it's not wealth, smiley face. Thumbs up if you think it's wealth. Good stuff. Yep, it's all coming through. Fantastic, folks. Yep. <laughs> I, I think everybody's on the same page here. Yeah, good stuff. We are I, we're exactly on the same page. I'm glad everybody's thinking the same way. Um, this is this is wealth. It, it is it is core, isn't it? It's because it's it's not primarily just about money. So is this wealth? Well. Personally, to me, it is because it gives me enjoyment. It gets me out. Um, my bike as well is a tool which I use to stay fit. Um, the camper van, which literally will hold its value all the time because I bought it at the right price, um, and I'll just be able to resale at the same value. So technically, it may cost me a bit of money to, to maintain it, but I would classify it as wealth. Can I just say on that, Jim, you said that... Uh... I should, should go back and just uh, a wee second when you were on about the, the camper van. You said yep. that uh, it might cost you a bit, but uh, it is wealth. And, and it, is, it is. It is. Well, when I say cost, I shouldn't really use that word, should I? It's it's an investment because the reality, the, the, the minimal cost that would, the minimal investment I put in this camper van in order to hire a camper van is probably a lot more than what this would be. So Absolutely. I see it. I see it as an investment, and also as a as something that will create wealth for me. Yeah. Wealth. Wealth or not wealth? This is an interesting one. So mm -hmm. silver bullion. A thumbs up if you think silver bullion is wealth, and a smiley face if you if you don't think so. What's your thoughts on it, James? So, yeah, there's a train of thought that, you know, when the apocalypse comes, you're going to be left with sort of the people that are going to survive quite well because they've got silver and gold. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not overly convinced. Uh, yeah, th well, I think I think we've got... Slight like shares, really, I think. Yeah, I, I, think, I think the same thing is that, you know... Jed's in was uh, Deborah's um, nope. Deborah doesn't agree. Um, <laughs> uh, Richard says it is, but I I think that I think there's there's a wee bit of difference so there, isn't there? It's the very fact that it, 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 you kind of take it with you, and it doesn't produce any income. It, it, all it does is is all that, all it does is store your cash, but, yep. but it's volatile to the market, isn't it? Yeah. Just in the same so, way as Bitcoin is, although less so, I think. Yeah. So do we do we see it? Um, do we see it as? Uh, do we see it as just a hedge? 
or, or, or something to protect against swing or volatility in, in, well, the, in, in somebody's money. And that's kind of what I was getting at. Classically, these are used to hedge uh, downturns and things like that. So, you know, mm -hmm. if I end up in a 2008, people have a, yeah. enough reserves in gold and whatever else, they can then trade that against whatever it is. But what people forget is that when times are tough, the prices of these things tend to drop as well. Yeah. And that's it. I mean, when you look at the price of bullion, uh, silver bullion, it's not moved up that dramatically since um, since the last 10 years. Uh, and the same with gold, it's not moved up that dramatically in the last 10 years either. Um, so I'm actually quite surprised a lot of people put their money into this. Um, but people tend, to, some people tend to think silver is, is, a, is a great thing. So, you know, this is my workforce. Wealth. Definitely. Um, I would say that. I'll, I'll just take that one straight away. That's wealth. <laughs> Nobody's going to argue with me because <laughs> it definitely is. And I'm sure your team members on the on the session agree that yep. as well. <laughs> and uh, gold bullion, probably the same as silver. Yeah, exactly that. Yeah. Uh, well, when I go back to silver and gold, Jim, it's also a, a very tricky thing when it comes to things like working out capital gains tax and all that malarkey. And it's, to me, it's a lot more trouble than it's worth, to be fair. So, wealth, family? Absolutely. I'm not talking about the outfits, though. <laughs> 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 Had to get that one in there. Eh? Uh, wealth or not wealth? Now, this is... Don't, don't say anything, James. Uh, just let's see what everybody thinks. Money. Thumbs up for a, for wealth and uh, smiley face for um, for you're no sure. Let me just see that coming through. Ah, difference of opinions again. <laughs> So we've got Jed says, yep, definitely. Deborah's not, no sure. Uh, Jim says, yep. Uh, Heather says, yep. Um, what's your thoughts on this, James? Susan's so, no sure. It's just a piece of paper at the end of the day, though, isn't it? There's no real intrinsic value to it. It's just a means to an end. You know, it pays the yep. bills. And, you know. Now, this is the key here with the distinction where we talk about the difference between wealth and income. Um, because essentially money is viewed as income, isn't it? In the majority of cases, money yeah. is money is income. And 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 it literally is a bit of paper for a promise no. And if you hold on to money, as in money, there's no wealth in that because it it, it depreciates in value with inflation. So so I, I understand completely how everybody do a thumbs up. But in wealth creation, I see we, we see it as um, we see it as a, a, as as it's not part of wealth; it's actually income. And I'll talk about the difference in a minute. And the banks themselves don't even see it as a as a. They wouldn't invest in money either. Well, at the end of the day, the banks just see it as numbers on a screen. You know, there's no in, real intrinsic value in the paper. Yeah. Um, so wealth, um, fitness, triathlon. That's to me, that's wealth because that's creation of that. Um, oh, here's a controversial one. Uh, now, wealth. <laughs> I think you give the game away there. Sorry. Uh, th thumbs up if you think that's wealth, and uh, a smiley face if you think it's not. Oh, oh, wow. <laughs> well done, Jed. <laughs> nice one. <laughs> so Heather's come up with smiley face. Jed's like taking the taking the fifth. It's like both. <laughs> well, uh, Susan's, uh, Susan's done smiley face. Deborah's done a uh, thumbs up um, as wealth. Um, it, it, can it be classed as wealth? What do you think? I think with this one, Jim, for the odd person that you see that's made a success with trading these things and not just buying them and holding on to them, but actually trading them, there's many, many hundreds of thousands of people that lose out on 
Bitcoin yeah. and the equivalent, well, if you pardon the expression, shit coin. Um, mm-hmm. there, was a, there was a coin released not that long ago called the Squid Game coin. Yeah. And over the course of about six days, there was, there was something ridiculous, like 20 odd million or something pumped into it. And the creators pulled the rug, basically, and ran off with the 20 million. So, yeah. So, uh, right, so it, it's it's do, do you see it as gambling then? Absolutely, because what derives its value? You know, there, there's no bricks, there's no mortar, there's you know, there's, there's no there's no tangible value to these things. <laughs> uh, Deborah thought it was running medals. That's why. <laughs> You'd be better I off with the medals. I would wonder why she had a thumbs up. Okay, I, I give you. I can give you that one, Deborah. Definitely. Uh, you'd be better off with the medals. Uh, yeah, exactly, because they would be they would have have some intrinsic hard value. They wouldn't actually be volatile. I Absolutely. mean, when you think about a currency, it drops overnight by twenty percent. Um, you've got you've got to think that that can't be wealth, um, because there is a huge risk involved in that. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. I, I, in my opinion, and this is just my opinion. Listen, uh, the, you'll get opinions on here from James and from myself. Uh, to be honest, you don't need to listen to them at all. Uh, form your own opinion, um, because that's the most important thing based on things that we discuss. So that's okay for you to have a different opinion from us. Um, um, it, it's it's fine, um, but just form your own opinion. But I, I know where I got to. Go, I know where I got to with my opinions. <laughs> so I'm quite happy with my opinions. <laughs> and can I just say before we move on, we often describe it as betting, but as with any betting, you should only. You know, if you're tempted to dabble with it, only put in what you can afford to lose at the end of the day. Yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah, that's a, that is a real good point. It's when you're actually doing Bitcoin, it, it's what you can afford to lose. It's exactly the same as I would say going to a casino. Um, you go to a casino with money in your pocket and you just take what you can afford to lose. Um, Come back out of I go on that principle and that's it. And, and if you're up, you're up, cash out, and you've won. Um, if you're not, you're no better off because you knew fine that that's what you were probably going to lose. Um, and, and, and oh, this is an instant one. So, your family home. Uh, now, a family home, tell me, uh, let's have a thumbs up or a smiley face if you think your family home is wealth creation. Thumbs up. If you think it's, you're not sure if it's wealth creation, then give me a smiley face. So your family home. Okay, we've got a thumbs up from Deborah, thumbs up from Heather, thumbs up from Richard, um, Jed, smiley face, no so sure. So, what's your thoughts, um, James? So, yeah. that's a tricky how do, one. How do the rich think about their family home? So, there's a lot of people that advocate that a family home generally should be rented. But, uh, you know, if it's a family home, I, I'd see it as an asset. Mm-hmm. You know, there, there might be a small amount of liability with that, you know, constant, well, not constant, but... Uh, routine repairs and stuff like that, but it's similar to what a lot of people do in London. They use it as a bank. It holds yeah. it, it holds the value of the you know whatever that is they're, they're investing in. Um, there's various things you can do with the property. Obviously, we won't talk about that tonight, but you know it, it is the means to produce even more wealth. You're absolutely right. Um, family home in the face of it is really just a family home. It's not a wealth creation tool because you're living in it for the sake of looking after your family and yourself itself. Um, When you think about the logic, if you're going to buy another house, it's proportionately the same price. So you're no better or worse off by going to the next house, because you had exactly the same house next door, and you moved to that one, and because you moved to that one, then it'd be exactly the same price as the one you've got now. So you've not actually increased your money, you've not decreased your money, but it's, it's hedged against everything. So it is key to get on the property ladder um, at this point in time in order to hedge that position so you've got a house to go in the future and you can stay on the ladder. I mean, because once you're off, you're off. Now, if I said, 
that same and, and you're absolutely right as well james um your family house can be used as another tool in order to make even more money uh, elsewhere with the intrinsic value it's locked into your house in equity i agree with that completely so the other thing is if, if i said that house was a second home and it was rented what would you say um would if i said that was a rented second home uh, thumbs up for a wealth creation tool or a smiley face if you don't know Yep, I'm thinking that can consensus opinion. You're playing this game as well, James. I am. <laughs> or, or has somebody cloned you? No, no, I'm just showing off. <laughs> I'm using my mobile as well. Yeah, imagine if somebody's into your, into your uh, account that you don't know about. Eh? <laughs> so everybody, yeah, everybody, everybody agrees. So I think I think the consensus is everybody understands that that a, a rental property is definitely a wealth creation tool, um, and and I would agree with that completely. Um, so. What, what what does this do that a normal family home doesn't do then, James? Uh, so it's generating revenue. It's yeah. gener generating cash flow, rather. I must stop using the term revenue, but it generates cash flow. Income. So that, well, yeah, yeah. And also, there's another benefit. What else does it do? It generates income on a month-to-month -month basis, and also it what? It increases in value over time. Yeah. So it, it develops wealth through capital appreciation. So we've got two sides there, and this is why I have the distinction here. This is exactly what it is. This is the this is so everybody understands the difference between income and wealth and what the difference is. Uh, income primarily comes from a number of sources, and I'll read it out here in case anybody can't read it. Um, income is wages and earnings from work. Uh, the main one for the majority of the population. Um, it's benefits for people that can't afford, uh, can't work or don't have a job, universal credit, maybe state pensions, maybe occupational pensions. It's rent from ownership and property and land. So rent is income. Interest from savings and dividend payments from shares. Now, wealth, on the other hand, is a completely different category. It's the ownership of property and land. It's the rights of an occupational pension. Um, so the rights rather than the income from it it's the savings in the bank, it's the investments in shares and bonds, and it's also, and they never put it on there, it's also things like it's your family, it's your friends round about you, it's your whole livelihood, it's your fitness levels as well. Right? That is intrinsically wealth. Have we got anything to add to this, James? Uh, just have a quick look through the list here. Um, I don't think there's anything... To add, really, uh, but in terms of income, uh, yeah, what you want to look at is your sort of baseline figure, what you're, you're drawing in, what has to get paid out, and you'll be quite surprised with what's left. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you're far better being on the right-hand side of this this uh, sheet than the left. Well, the left side, and I'll, and I'll make it quite clear, the left side you're taxed on. Absolutely. The right side you're not. Because if you don't realise the asset, your wealth continues to go up and you don't get taxed on it. The only way you get taxed is if you die. But by that time, it's irrelevant. And you can use uh, uh, things to mitigate that 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 position. Absolutely. So let me quickly just talk about... Um, so what the dictionary... This is interesting. This is interesting. This comes down to cultural beliefs. So what the dictionary defines uh, is an abundance of valuable possessions or money, or a plentiful supply of a particular desirable thing. Then it says, then it goes on to say similar things like affluence, prosperity, opulence, riches, means, substance, luxury, well-being, plenty, deep pockets, money, cash, capital, principle, treasure, fortune, finance, assets, possessions, resources, effects, goods, funds. And so, and, and can you hear that? Valuables, property, stocks, reserves. There's a lot of these things in there which we don't agree is wealth, and yet it's in that definition and associated with that definition in the dictionary. So is it any surprise that people actually struggle to understand how to accumulate wealth and how to make money? I don't think it's a surprise at all. Obviously, there's a lot of things in there that are grey areas in terms of is it income or is it wealth? 
Yeah. You're breaking up, James. <laughs> I missed that. <laughs> Sorry, what I said there. was that uh, obviously with this sort of grey area, some of the items that you mentioned in there differentiating yeah. between income and wealth. Um, you're right. It's no wonder that people get confused with what the difference is between the two. Yeah, because it, it's intrinsically built into our culture. Even Investopedia uh, defines wealth as wealth measures the value of an uh, all assets and worth owned by a person, community, company, or country. Wealth is determined by taking the total market value of all physical and intangible assets owned and then subtracting all the debts. Essentially, wealth is accumulation of scarce resources. Uh, and yet, uh, it's interesting, it, it never goes on. Specific people, organisations and nations are said to be wealthy when they're able to accumulate many valuable resources or goods. Wealth can be contrasted to income and in that wealth is a stock and income is flow. Uh, and that's fine, I understand that. But not at, once, not at one point has anybody actually in this definition actually said wealth is your health. Excuse the pun because it rhymes <laughs> but they don't do that they don't say it's the people round about you they don't say it's the 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 um health that you have it doesn't say anything like that at all so is it something we have to change in our culture to understand i think when it comes to some of those items jim uh if you look up what success is a lot of those are defined as success as opposed to wealth yeah you know, your health is you're successful. Have you brought up a good family? It's success as opposed to wealth. But I, I, I would argue that it's also wealth. All right. So, so it isn't it. It isn't any surprise that we're, we're we are confused from from a very young age because we're indoctrinated into this mentality that um, you know depreciating assets like cars and uh, motorhomes and speedboats are all signs of wealth. When in actual fact, you and I know yourself that, well, you could lease all that, to be honest. Yeah, I, th I think at a sort of rudimentary stage, you know, when we're growing up as children, you know, we'll start off with like a, a child's bank book that, you know, the bank comes into the school once a month or something, so you can put in a pound or whatever. Uh, from there, we're kind of taught to stick in at school, you know, get a good job, earn a promotion. But as you're doing all that, you're gaining liabilities as opposed to gaining assets. Yeah. So, I think it's the way we're taught as opposed to how we envisage what wealth and income is. Mm -hmm. It starts at an early age. Definitely. Right, it's an indoctrination. Okay, okay. So, well, so let's come on to next, um, and we'll come on to uh, source and property in a minute, because um, that's, the, that's the last thing. So let's come on to a couple of examples here about wealth creation. So this is what, this is what you did, James. Um, mm -hmm. I'll show you that the now. Um, so, what could you could you could you could you talk me through your story first of all? Yep, certainly. So, uh, you know, I've had various jobs since I left school. So, I, know, I remember I had a, a period where I was working in a supermarket uh, for quite a long time, and uh, the, the role itself it was fine. But after a, minute, a certain amount of time, it began to get a bit stale. So I started with a communications company within the town that I was working in at the time, mm -hmm. um, while still working part-time for the supermarket, and uh, got a secondment into software testing team, which was fine, mm -hmm. uh, and I've been doing sort of software testing ever since, but for predominantly throughout my career I've been contracting, uh, so I was a day rate contractor, uh, I won't tell you the values, but it was a significant amount of money that I was earning. Yeah. Uh, at the time, uh, and thanks to Mr. Osborne, he came along and says, oh, these contractors are making a shed load of money. Uh, we want a cut or we want a limit of what they can make. So they brought in this IR35 rule, which mm -hmm. basically killed the industry more or less overnight because uh, it forced people into a no-rights employment scenario or go permanent. So it was a bit of a shock going from sort of the contractor rate down to a sort of fixed the uh, salary mm -hmm. and at that point i thought well i'm gonna to have to do something to top up the salary and eventually potentially move away from that kind of sort of level of working and uh let the properties more or less take care well i say take care of themselves but have, have yeah. managed for me and build up a decent sized portfolio in order to do that so why property because uh your assets are continually appreciating uh, why? Why? How did you know that? Where did you find that out about? And how long ago was that? 
So I suppose to a certain extent you could say I became an accidental landlord initially. Yeah. So we had a property in Glenmore, eh, it's in Kirkcaldy, and my wife wanted to move back closer to her mother and father's. Eh, and because my salary was, sorry, because I was an IT contractor at the time, I was able to get a, a, a good property in eh, my wife's parents' hometown. Eh, that didn't mean that we had to sell the, the old one, so mm-hmm. we decided to do a bit of refurb on it and uh, rent it out. Uh, and I've been renting that for, I think this is fourth year now. Uh, generally, it's £625 a month, uh, three bedroom. Wow. Everything had been done to it. Uh, and it's interesting because we were talking about uh, increasing value over time. So not only did we force capital appreciation on it by doing all this refurb work, the wife bought it at thirty two and a half thousand pounds in two thousand, and we just recently had it valued at one hundred and twenty five. I think it was. Is this the one so, we're going to show? No, no, this is a separate one altogether. This is a different one. So, yeah, it's a different one. So that 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 immediately you've got wealth. You've got wealth locked in there immediately. That was a catalyst, yeah. And then you've also got income coming in. Um, effectively, the average uh, the average salary in in Fife, uh, according to the according to things, I think it's trying to be 25 to 27,000. Yep. So you've got about three and a half. You've automatically, you've automatically done a, about a third. I've got a third <laughs> of that just my property. Aye, about <laughs> almost, probably maybe between a quarter and a third of the income you've got coming in for that property is actually the average wage. Yeah, but to take that and stage one further, property. Yes, but to take that stage further on refinancing out of that, that allowed me to buy another three. So in actual fact, I'm hitting the, I'm more than hitting the, the average income. Just out the four properties you bought, and it's just a house you had in the first place because you were absolutely. Unique. And and yeah. we'll probably talk about that in future shows. Uh, we'll yeah. all talk about that in future shows actually, and we'll probably talk about that in the deep dive when we actually go into the, you know, the property investors club on Zoom, yeah. um, as well as that as well. Do you want to take me through this property that you've got here, um, till I show you what, where is this property? Um, I'll just put it on the screen. Right. So the property I shared with you is in Glenrothes. Yep. See the lovely mirrors. I didn't look bonny, does it? Hi. <laughs> don't put mirrors on walls. It's, it knackers the walls. It ended up having to get fully replastered throughout and so on. Yeah. So, what did What did you buy this for? So I bought that for sixty thousand. Uh, that was including fees and my arrangement fees. Uh, yep. Stamp all that sort of stuff. They'll. So all in sixty thousand. All in sixty thousand. Does that include legals as well? That was everything. That was a whole lot. Wow. Okay. Good. It was give or take uh, about forty quid either way. I think it was. And, and what, what was it? What what type of property was it? So it's a I two mean, bedroom mid terrace property in Rimbleton. Wow. Uh, built in the sixties. Sixty grand in Rimbleton. Sixty grand in Rimbleton. <sighs> Jeez, that's a good price, eh? So, if you so were, how, did, how did you manage, how did you get this one? Where did you get so it from? How did... If anybody was watching the show on Saturday, I did kind of explain it there. So yeah. I bought this directly off a solicitor's firm that deals with winding up estates. So they don't, so this particular solicitor doesn't advertise on Zoopla or Rightmove. So yep. it was a, a niche purchase, if you will. Mm-hmm. So went directly to them. They had an agent that actually showed us around the property from Martin & Co., uh, the wee woman was absolutely lovely and she says, I think you'll get it for such and such a price and that's what we went in with and that's what was accepted Wow! so she done a fantastic job for us got a bunch of flowers and a box of chocolates out of it of course but, mm-hmm. aye. so £60,000 it was an off, kind of off market sort of scenario uh, obviously some issues with the property you know, some of the double glazing was old alu glaze type stuff that had yep. blown because you're showing your age, are you glaze? <laughs> are you glaze? <laughs> and and so in terms of purchase price was sixty thousand. Sixty. Um and uh, um how much did it cost you to, to refurb then? Eighteen thousand four hundred all in. That was everything though, including a uh, new double glazing, new heating system, uh, rewiring back to brick more or less. That fireplace is gone. Uh, and we'll talk. We'll take a look at that now. Actually, aye. You can take a swing through the photos. So that's the before and after. That's the before and after. Yep. You get a nice wow. view of the woman tells out the, the the other window because that's a dual aspect room. That's even better. I, I recognise the style. This is this. I've got a funny feeling. This is a similar style to Linwood Drive, Linwood Gardens. 
Um, I think probably the contract uh, two, two bedrooms and bathrooms upstairs. Uh, two bedrooms and a bathroom upstairs. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, a, it's a typical style that you used to use. Um, yeah. Uh, well, it's a local authority. Water. Solid local authority property. I, I and this is what I don't understand, and I keep telling the surveyors they've got a thing about downgrading local authority properties and valuations as opposed to normal properties, and they're, they're just as they're just as good, if not better, as far as I'm concerned. They are better. I'm in a new build at the moment. It's horrendous. <laughs> yeah. And and I think they'll stand the test of time. So they're good properties to buy. So Absolutely. there's the kitchen now. Big difference, eh? Yep. So new kitchen. Did you put new heat in? New heat was in. It's hidden behind one of the cupboards in the kitchen. We like to hide the boilers. And there's the bedroom. So did you not think about changing mirror wardrobes, or was that? Well, I did think about it, but then, uh, yeah, the, right. the, the cost started to sort of climb yeah. up a bit. They're kind of all right, though, weren't they? Ah, yeah, they're all right. They're rose gold, and rose gold at the when we first started was sort of kind of fashionable. All the phones were rose gold at the time and stuff. Yeah. So. Aye. And then one of the other ones, and then that's what it's like now. Yep. Huge difference. And did you put the solid wood doors on? or yeah, the... Howden's doors, yep. Yep. And you read it throughout a whole lot, you know, that's a boiler hidden in the cupboard in the kitchen. An energy efficient boiler. New doors? New doors. Excellent. Yep, new doors. See, that's a huge difference between the, there and there, eh? And it's good because we actually built in a wee trap door there as well so that people can, you know, if there was any work needing done under the house, then straight down the trap door. Send and it here? Down. Uh, just to the left-hand side there, just under where the meter box usually sits. Just under there, yeah. Uh, there's a trap there to chuck the apprentice down. And then you've got your smoke detector. So that was all in. So yep. in terms of all in, so what was your price all in? 78,400. 78,400. So what was, um, what was your... Uh, uh, did you? Did, what was the uh, the valuation when you were finished? So the valuation when we were finished, I'm pretty sure this was the one that was revalued at 115. Uh, did you actually get a mortgage on it? Yeah, I did get a mortgage on it. Oh, let's let's talk about this. Give me two seconds, and I'll get my screen up. <laughs> and then we'll show you because I think this will be a great one to show people um, on here. Um, so let's, let's, let's punch in numbers and then see. Can can everybody see that? I can. Yep, everybody can see that more than likely. Okay, so you bought you you got the you got it revalued. How much? Uh, one hundred and fifteen, I think it was. Okay. Now you don't you don't have stamp duty anymore because it's a it's a revaluation, so it's zero for stamp duty. Your deposit yep. is what twenty five percent. Well, the deposit well it was already mortgage, you see, so there was no real deposit to put in. But, but I need to leave twenty five percent in, obviously. You'll you'll have left twenty five percent in. Aye. Yeah. Aye. Okay. Your mortgage rate? Uh, I think that's one at 2.69 or 2.79. We'll take 2.79. Uh, your arrangement fee for your mortgage, what was that? £1,000? £500. Wow. Brilliant. Yep. The mortgage works. £500. Oh. Jeez. <laughs> I know. That's a lot, eh? <laughs> 0. 0.0075. No wonder I'm breaking a sweat. There you go. I'll, I'll, that'll, that'll do point, point zero zero six. Oh, that's me getting pernickety. There you go. And uh, so your interest is about two hundred one pound a month. Uh, a, uh, about that. Uh, right, what deal did you get on it? What? How many years did you get a fixed rate for a term? Uh, a fixed rate for two years, but I'm going to move on to a five year once that deal comes to an end. Okay, great stuff. So two years. And what's your rent coming in? Uh, five fifty a month for that one. Obviously, there's ten percent. Well, twelve percent plus, uh, including VAT uh, for management, but I uh, five fifty a month. Yep, got that factored in. So basically, um, I know now we're going to talk about this in general. Have you bought that one hundred and fifteen? Which you probably wouldn't, have, um, because nobody would buy. It. You would very rarely buy a buy to let at five fifty because that's no the that's no the rule. Um, yeah. But you you would if, if it was you would be you'd be clearing three hundred forty eight twenty seven after the mortgage is paid, mm -hmm. um, every month. But because you've leveraged it with this, uh, your gross yield, which is the amount in divided by the total um, purchase price, uh, divided by the, the the total rent, the, the total rent divided by the total purchase price for cash is five point seven. But mm -hmm. you have used the bank's money in that occasion, and it would have been a fifteen percent 
leverage position. So you would have got another ten percent of it. But on this occasion, you have you had seventy eight thousand in here, and you got a mortgage for eight to six thousand. So yep. you effectively got cash back. I did. Yeah. So you've got an infant return. Exactly. And that's that's the key, isn't it? The key it is, is. To, actually, to actually get an infinite return. Yeah. Uh, and and make sure you make sure you cover yourself. So yep. your your infinite return out of that. Now, probably a classic example, um, similar situation for myself. I'll just zero all these again. And I'll do I'll do mine next. Um, so here we go. Uh, how much time have we got? Just check on. No, let's talk about some of the ways you can buy. Right, let's let's go on. Let's let's move on. We can talk about my one next week. So infinite return, that's the ultimate game here. Uh, to get an infinite return, get all the money back out. There is occasions where you can't do all that, but you still want to make sure your numbers are right. And we could talk about that. We'll talk about that in the 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 sessions that we have on, on the Zoom. Uh, if anybody wants more information, we will be talking about it in successive weeks to come. Um, Susie actually says, I wish I can get that in St. Andrews. Um, well, <laughs> <Don't> we <all. laughs> I, I wouldn't be investing in St. Andrews. <laughs> I would actually, I would actually be. I, we know where to invest, don't we? And well, again, we'll talk about it in successive shows to come um, for people. So, how do we go about finding these properties in the first place? Um, let's talk about in the last fifteen minutes about how we source them. Um, where is the where is the places you can get property, and how would you start, James? Right, if you're going down the traditional route, you can uh, go to individual uh, estate agents or check the portals the, yep. uh, and uh, right move on on the market all that sort of stuff would you, your, would, you suggest, probably... would you suggest registering with the websites like right move and zoopla for, absolutely for alerts? absolutely yeah. and make sure you're very specific with the criteria so for things like uh, so we tend to get if you're getting below market value properties we tend to be uh, properties that require a bit of repair so some of these uh, some of these criteria that you can set as things like uh, yeah. requires a remodel or modernization or whatever you can put in as a keyword and you'll get alerted to anything that requires a bit of modernization i mean i know there's a couple of the portals at the moment in the north for around about fifty thousand that are in need of modernization yep yeah. uh, so you can also put ads and, on and that's that's in right moving zoopla's engine yes yeah absolutely now, there obviously has to be a level where you think to yourself, "Wait a minute, that's that's a bit too expensive." Do, do you know, we didn't really want to drill too deep into that, do we? But there will be a level where you think, even though it requires refur refurbishing, the numbers didn't make sense. Uh, and we'll, again, we'll talk about that success. It won't make sense if it's in areas where there's a ceiling, for example. Yeah, and that's and, where you most run the risk. Yeah, definitely. So right move Zoopla, um, and I like what you said, solicitors' websites are great because often the smaller solicitors don't have any involvement with Zoopla right move at all. So Absolutely. hardly anybody sees it. Absolutely. Um S1 Homes is probably another another one. A lot yep. of people see I've seen agents just use S1 Homes, but they've not used anything else. And very few people actually use S1 Homes. Um, it tends to be a West Coast. Uh, website um, in Glasgow because it's owned by the Glasgow Herald, but it's still a good tool. Yeah, it um, used to be STV or, or something at one point, didn't it? That owned it. Yeah, it did. Yeah. So S1 Homes, and then we have what about what about other sources? Um, see, when you speak to estate agents, what should uh -huh. you say to them? What what should we be saying to them? Well, you want to make sure they know exactly what sort of thing you're looking for. Uh, yeah. You know, some people also specialise in things like portfolios and stuff as well. Well, you'll know yourself, Jim, you'll have uh, people that come to you all the time, offering you deals and so on. Yeah. And uh, some of these, that, for whatever reason, you won't be able to sell yourself, but you you know, you, you have the knowledge that there's, there's opportunities there. Yeah. So word of mouth is another one. It's, it's definitely that. It's speak to estate agents, um, but I would. Uh, how how do you approach them? Do you go in just with you the? Can't, you can't just you can't just kick the saloon door and say, "Look, I'm looking for this, and it has to be thirty percent below market value, and you know, it needs Could a wee bit of work." But not my, too much. my experience, my experience in the early days, when you had everybody running off of these courses, 
you, you knew straight away they had signed up to a course and they'd just finished it because they were so enthusiastic about everything. And they ran in the door and they said, this is what I want. This is how I want it. I want it below market value. And you kind of think, no chance. Um, do you not so get sick of the people? Stage, it switches us off. <laughs> and do you not get sick of the people that are offering you so much coffee that you can, you can never drink it all? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so my advice is probably with estate agents is maybe speak to them and actually explain to them that you that what what you're trying to achieve, but you're quite happy to pay home report value if the numbers make sense. Absolutely. And you're quite happy to pay a bit more than home report value if the numbers make sense. That way you're not going on the back foot straight away as if to say, I'm looking for below market value properties. Because the, the, I, I think generally at this point in time, they'll laugh you at the place. Well, as much as property is about property, it's also about people. And you don't want yeah. to start uh, upsetting people straight I, I, I think you're going to use the word piss off. <laughs> piss well, off. You, what, I'm, <laughs> what I'm suggesting is you're better working with people as opposed to trying working against them. You, you know? are, eh? And, and, yeah. and so go in with the tact. And I'm quite happy to do that all the time. And I always talk to people on Facebook about that as well. It's like, you know, I'm quite happy to pay home report value with even above if the numbers make sense. I'm fine with that. Um, but often, sometimes it doesn't, so it's okay just to make the offer below if, if it makes sense for you. Um, but your, your your rule of thumb is don't go in straight away and actually say you're looking for below market value properties, or or everybody will just switch off in the office. Um, don't. Another thing as well is a lot of people make a big thing of this, but uh, you know they'll go in and they'll hit them directly with their price. But you have to be able to lift everything up. You know, go to your view and make sure that you you, you take your notes and. Uh, you're checking for things like roof conditions and electrics and that sort of thing. Uh, and don't just go straight and go and go with, with figures because at uh, that point of, time it's just figures. Do you find a lot of people as, as well, and this is what I, how I see it, is a lot of people actually just look um, at the home report. They don't actually walk around the property and see what actually needs done because um, the home report is not a factual statement. Sometimes it's only generalisation. Yeah, so it doesn't, say, it doesn't say the kitchen needs changed. It doesn't say there's no smoke detectors or heat detectors because that's a requirement. It doesn't say there's not an EICR. It, 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 it doesn't say all these compliance issues that a rental property will have that a normal residential property might not need. And even things like roofs and things, they won't admit, openly admit that the, the roofs even uh, looked at. They would just say, following recommendations, that it should be looked at X amount of time over a number of years. Yeah. Um, so it's only indicative. But it doesn't give you the full picture. You have to really go and see these things for yourself. So if you want to try and get property before it gets to an estate agent, um, what would be your suggestions? Um, so you there's know? a number of ways you can do this. You can go, some people print a load of leaflets and do mailers and that sort of thing. Very expensive to do. Um, you can put ads on Facebook Marketplace. You know, you can chuck a, an ad in that's like, you could set a budget, like a, a £3 a day budget. Uh, you can use Facebook Market Pay, Place, uh, Gumtree, that sort of thing. And you can just simply say, we're looking for to buy any property, any condition for cash or whatever, uh, whatever the situation is. And uh, people will come back. Uh, and it only really takes that one deal, really, to reinvest all yeah. that time you've taken to produce these things. And I tell you what, there's certain things to say. And again, we'll talk about this in our private sessions, because I'll be able to tell you as well. Um, there's certain things you, you should say because there are certain things you shouldn't say because you'll switch the people off straight away. Yeah. So you can, you can do all the Facebook ads in the world, but if you say the wrong thing, nobody will respond to it at all and you'll just be wasting your time completely. Um, so Facebook adverts, canvas and flyers, uh, newspaper adverts, should we still do that? Is there no golden opportunity there to do that? Do people actually go to the back pages now in, in newspapers? I'm not, I'm not really, I'm not really sure. sure. Well, I've got a sneaking suspicion it might be an avenue um, because no one's using it, so you're you're going to get probably as a cheap rate. Uh, LinkedIn ads. Uh, investor portfolios. This is interesting because what some people have been doing, they've been trying to beat the LinkedIn algorithm, and rather than paying for ads, what they do is they, they put on a post, just a general post, yeah, and they get people, uh, like-minded people, to either comment on it or give it a thumbs up or whatever. And because of the way the algorithm works, it keeps bumping that to the top of the list. So they're actually getting advertised without actually paying for advertising. They're just relying on goodwill of other people. Yeah, I didn't notice that. Post. <laughs> I did notice that. Google ads? Uh, it's been in my life, AdSense. 
Roadside, <laughs> roadside ads. I've got a better one, but I'll discuss that privately with you, Jim, because it's yeah. probably a good one to get investors. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm just taking notes, by the way. <laughs> I've got loads of notes here, but I'm actually reinforcing all my notes and making sure. I'm thinking about an advert for the first and eighteenth hole, a number of golf courses. <laughs> what, what about um, what about Facebook community pages? Good source. Uh, potentially, yeah. Well, again, a lot of these have like local uh, trading play pages. So, uh, like in the state that I'm in, we've got uh, like a Collinswell one that's Collinswell Trading. Right. And uh, it's kind of like the whole sort of free cycle stuff. A lot of things yeah. get given away for free, but they do give pointers to other things that are for sale. Quick one so far. If everybody's following us, please just give us a wee thumbs up um, just to say you're there and you, you understand what we're saying and how we're doing it. Um, private sellers via uh, via free website listings? Uh, well, Gumtree's free, isn't it, at the minute? Yep. Uh, although it's owned by eBay, but yeah, it's, it's free. Empty properties, um, empty properties out, out and about. What would you do with them? Just stick something through the door. Uh, well, you can either stick something through the door. And I know one that uh, I had to go to huge lengths to try and uh, get some information, and I had to go through a land registry and found out that the property belonged to somebody that has a taxi company that went bust. Yeah, but although I went to the the new address that she went to, uh, she never ever got back in touch with me. But it was a beautiful house uh, near yeah. the Dean Park. So, there, so there's quite a lot. Um, I mean, we're coming to the end of here. A, a, assisted sales is another one. What about yep. estate agents? Here's a good one. Estate agents where the property really is in disrepair, um, but the estate agent's got it on, and it's no shifting. So you could possibly, if the numbers are right, make an offer based on the fact that you will you will assist the re renovation of the property. You will give them the market value as it is just now, um, and then subsequently, you might split the profits once it's sold. And there's actually a way to do that quite sneakily. So on Rightmove, there's a plugin for Google Chrome that yep. allows you to track the movement of property prices. So you can see when it's went up and down in price or whatever. Um, and it gives you an idea when the last price change was, what it was changed from to and to. And for properties that just aren't selling, you can contact the estate agent direct and say, look, I know you've had this on the board since January 2011, eh, sorry, 2021 or whatever. Yeah. Uh, I noticed that there's four uh, significant drops in valuation through time. What would your vendor feel as if it offered X amount? Mm -hmm. And uh, they'll take it to the they'll take it to the vendor if it hasn't shifted. You've got nothing it. to lose, haven't you? You've got nothing Absolutely. to lose. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. They can only say no. Um, that's the reality. Yeah. Uh, Again, you don't want to you don't want to annoy estate agents, but they understand the, the rules. Now, I've got a queen of other things that we could talk about, um, but we're actually just coming to an end just now. So, uh, and my final one for here, and just my final thought is keep your existing home you're moving from if it makes sense, and then actually just get another one, uh, and it's actually take the, money, take the money, which is what we showed everybody in the credit crunch. So the credit crunch, nobody was able to sell their homes. We actually said, I tell you what remortgage it by to let because everybody's wanting rented properties because they're obviously getting repossessed so they wanted rented properties remortgage it that allows you to take the money out put the deposit down for your next home job's done and then we had a lot of people actually able to do that as a natural result of that so i would say keep existing home uh, and and i've got probably one one two three four five i've probably got six seven eight i've probably got another eight things um but but that's it we've come to the end already <laughs> And I never even got to talk about my one. We'll talk about that next week. <laughs> I was desperate to talk about that one. Because <laughs> well, that was a really good, that was an amazing deal. I couldn't believe that, what, what I got that for. I, and that was via a property sourcer. Um, but I'll tell, I'll talk, I'll talk about that deal next week. But that's it, guys. Thank you very much to everyone for just staying with us, giving the thumbs up and all the rest of it. If you get a chance, please take time to share this. You never know who's out there to come in as well. And we could share between each other and ideas and what we could be doing and how we could be doing it um, for the next Wealth Creation Show. So tune in next Monday at 6.30. James and I will be talking again about the next strategies, about what to do next. We might reinforce this a bit more. Uh, and until next time, guys, bye-bye for now. Thanks, everyone.